when I got married about 50 years ago, not quite, there were speeches at the wedding. And an Englishman got up and he said, I have no jokes about Irishmen. And I thought I was delivered from all kinds of pain. And then he added, of course, he said, it is quite obvious that it is no joke being an Irishman. <laughs> it is a great pleasure to be with you all this year. And I'm especially delighted that this conference is taking place in Poland. My journey from Katowice to Wisła was a journey down memory lane. For in the late 70s and the early 80s, I've been preaching in almost every single town and village around this area, in Cheshire, in Bielsko Bujawa, in Skotchów, in Hoshów, in Jastrzębie, and so on and so forth. And the idea that such a conference would ever be possible in this country is really a miracle taking place. And I think it's wonderful to see many of my Polish friends from those days still here, who bore the brunt of defending the Christian faith in very difficult circumstances. And I think it's a great encouragement to them to see that this is possible in these days. Now, in my previous two series of studies at ELF, I considered the lives of two of the great pioneer leaders of Scripture, Joseph and Daniel. They both rose to become leaders of major world empires, Joseph of Egypt and Daniel of both Babylon and Medo-Persia. They were both of them men whose success as leaders was due to their walk in faith in the enduring reality of God. And one of the lessons we learned from Daniel was that he did not simply maintain his devotion to God privately. He maintained his public witness to the very end of his life. And we saw that as an immense challenge for us in an age where the pressure to privatize faith is increasing every day. Now this year we're going back even further in history to consider the life of a man who was their common ancestor in two senses, physically and spiritually. A man who's held out to us in Scripture as the great pioneer of faith. His name is Abraham. But there's a very big difference between Abraham and Joseph and Daniel. The New Testament only mentions Joseph six times and Daniel once. Whereas Abraham is central to the development of New Testament theology and is mentioned over 60 times and is a principal figure in the books of Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. I have discovered him to be a formidable character, a big character. I heard yesterday of a man who had many children, all of them having biblical names. And the father was asked, why didn't you call one of your children Abraham? And he said, we thought about it, but the name's too big for any child to bear. And that is a sense that I have had as I've studied this great man who is partly enigma and partly mystery and defies every classification that I can find. And the biblical account of his life has raised in my mind as many questions as it has done answers. And I am going to share with the experts here many of those questions and very few of the answers. In one sense, of course, Abraham is the mirror opposite of both Daniel and Joseph. Abram was called, firstly, to leave the region of Mesopotamia, to which Daniel would later be deported. And secondly, Abraham himself was deported from Egypt, where eventually Joseph would run the empire. Abram lived first as a city dweller in Ur and Haran, 
and then as a migrant nomad. He never ruled a nation, let alone an empire. And in a sense, there's a spiritual logic here. God calls the man Abram out from the Mesopotamian culture to live as a pilgrim so that he can learn the fundamental lessons of what it means to trust God. He is the paradigm of faith in God. But then, as the centuries roll, God will choose people out of his descendants who've learned those lessons to go back into the secular city to witness for him. So there's a movement to get the world out of the pilgrim before you send the pilgrim back into the world armed with the message that the world needs to hear. Now, Abram was chosen by God to be the progenitor of a nation that was to bring blessing to the whole world. Joseph and Daniel are magnificent examples of that happening. But they, in turn, are far outshadowed by the one who is described as the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Our New Testament begins with, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob. Christianity is not a mere philosophy. Anybody with enough brains can think up a philosophy, but they cannot think up history. And Christianity is firmly anchored in historical events and in particular is geared and linked with the history of Abraham and his descendants. So there is a strong historical dimension to what we read, but there is more than that. It was never just history and physical descent. As Christ pointed out, in John 8, to those Jews who came to him and said, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. Jesus said to them, I know that you are Abram's offspring, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. If you were Abram's children, you would be doing what Abram did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who's told you the truth that I have heard from God. This is not what Abram did. You are doing what your father did. You are of your father the devil. So it's obvious, isn't it, that being one of Abram's true offspring is more than being physically descended from him. Listen to one of the key statements of justification by faith in Romans 4. We say that Abram's faith, that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith when he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised. And in Galatians, in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abram's offspring, heirs according to promise. Many years ago, I was in Israel. I had met a couple, a couple of years before that in Austria. Jewish people whose faith in God had been shattered by Auschwitz. And I met them again in Israel, and we went out for a meal. And we were talking animatedly about the role of Israel in history. And suddenly the wife said to me, she said, why aren't you a Jew? And I was slightly taken aback. Her husband was incensed. He said, my dear, you, you mustn't ask that question. Oh, I said, it's all right. I said, haven't you realized what I am? And she looked at me and she said, what are you? 
Well, I said, actually, I said, and I lowered my voice. I said, I'm a son of Abraham. She said, you are not. <laughs> I said, I am, but you can't be. You're not a Jew. Oh, I said, that's very interesting. I said, tell me, um, what do you have to do to be a son of Abraham? I said, well, you know, Abram had two sons, Yitzhak, Isaac, and Ishmael. Is, is Ishmael a Jew? Oh, no, she said. I said, why not? Well, he didn't have a Jewish mother. His mother was Egyptian. Oh, I said, that's very interesting. I said, tell me. I, I said, um, Isaac had two sons, Yezaf and Yaakov. Was Ezaf, Esau, a Jew? Oh, no, she said. I said, what about his mother? She was called Rivka, Rebecca. Oh, she said, it's a bit difficult, isn't it? <laughs> I said, it is, and I let them stew for a little while. And, and then um, I, I said, you know, it's almost as if God was choosing who the seed would be. Oh, she said, that's right. God was choosing. And I said, you know what? God has chosen that anybody who trusts God like Avram did, is counted a child of Avram, of Abraham. She looked at me for a long time and she said, you know, you have more hope for our nation than we have ourselves. But this gets exciting, ladies and gentlemen. You see, I've just read to you that if we are Christ's, we are Abram's seed as according to the promise. And I guarantee every one of us even though we find the reading of legal language boring in the extreme, with one exception, if it's a will that mentions us. <laughs> you will never see such a reversal of concentration if you find that somebody discovers that their name is written into a will. Now, you will notice in the New Testament, in connection with Abraham, there's a lot of legal language that some of it is highly technical. And the reading of wills is a dangerous thing, isn't it? It can bring great joy to some people. It can bring misery to others. It can rupture and destroy families, even Christian families. Inheritance, ladies and gentlemen, is a very big deal for all of us. And we shall be investigating it. But the fascinating thing here is this. You and I, if we trust Christ, are legal heirs of Abraham. What does that mean? Have you thought about what it actually means? We'll have to explore it because if I'm a legal heir of a man who's put a massive footprint on history... I better find out exactly what that means. So that is one of the things that we shall have to explore. But we need to explore it. Abram is such a big character. We need to explore it in a big context, the context of the whole structure and the thought flow of the book of Genesis. Now, you're going to need two things to follow me. You're going to need the notes, which are very inadequate, but they'll help. And you're going to need a Bible. I hope you've heard of a Bible. You are going to need it because I would expect you all to have read the text before we came. I had an email sent out to that effect. And secondly, that you follow because we're dealing with um, 15, 16 chapters of Scripture these four days. And so in order to be able to go at a reasonable pace, I will expect you to follow from Scripture. Now, the big picture of Genesis is relatively simple. You will see there that there are six major sections. The book splits into two halves, and it is organized or in, a, in a way agreed by most commentators with the expression that runs like, these are the generations of, or this is the account of. Now, it's slightly more sophisticated than having each section for one of those mentions. But roughly speaking, you have got Three big sections in the first half, the creation of the universe and human beings, then what it is to be human and the beginning of sin and death, and then from Adam to the judgment of the world where God 
destroys the world by water. And then the second half of the book is very easy to see how that's organized in a literary way. You can summarize it like this. I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. The first section of the second half is Abraham and his sons and ends with the death of Abraham. The second section is Isaac and his sons and ends with the death of Isaac. And the final section is Jacob and his sons and it ends with the death of both Jacob and Joseph. So in that sense, it's quite simple. The first section teaches us about the nature of God, about the status of the universe, about the status of human beings. And the major emphasis is that God speaks and he organizes and creates the universe by a speech act, and God said, which is an unpacking of John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word. And the high point is reached with the creation of human beings. And we read these magnificent and staggering words. And God said to them. And we learn that human beings are uniquely dignified by the status of being capable of understanding the speech of God. And the book of Genesis is going to unpack that, and particularly the story of Abram, as God speaks to him and reveals himself to him. Then section two starts again with the creation of human beings. You'll notice that the first three sections, each of them mentions the creation of human beings. Man made in the image of God. What does it mean? Well, man is made of the dust of the ground. He's physical. He has an aesthetic sense. He needs food. He's curious. He works. He has a relationship with wife and family. But then we discovered that life at its highest is a relationship with God that is defined by God's Word. And God said, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So in section one, it's creation by the Word. And in section two, it's the definition of human life at its highest as a relationship with God through His Word. And the key issue is, are humans going to trust the Word of God or not? And that is going to be the major topic of Genesis. Section one is an assault against naturalism. This universe is a creation of God. Section two is an assault against the redefinition of man and the utilitarianism that characterizes our Western world. And section three, the story of Noah, is again an assault on naturalism. But it tells us that in the past history of the universe, there was a break in the uniformity of nature. And God used a constituent element of the universe to destroy it, namely water. Stand back from all of that. Section 1 of Genesis talks about creation. Section 2 of Genesis talks about the fall and the beginnings of a hinted redemption. Section 3 talks about judgment. Those are three central pillars of what we call the theology of Christianity in the Bible. And we are reminded that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. That God will in the future one day intervene. It will be a rupture in the uniformity of nature when he will judge and use a constituent element of the universe to destroy it. Not water, but fire. So those three big things, and you will see how supernatural they are. There is such a profound dimension of supernaturalism in Scripture, right from the very beginning. So that's the first half of the book. Genesis, you see, not only gives an account of the temporal beginnings of the universe, but it also gives us a biblical anthropology in the original sense of that word. 
a logos, a kind of anthropos man. And Leon Kass, a Jewish writer of great academic distinction, suggests that the stories are powerful precisely because they present human life in all its moral ambiguity. They present to us not simply what once happened in a particular time and place, but in a very real sense, they will throw light on what always happens, and hence they will throw light on the complexity of our own lives. So Genesis does not simply show us what is first in time, but what is first in importance when it comes to understanding fundamental things. God, the universe, life, language, morality, relationships, sin, death, faith, salvation, judgment. And the first three sections reveal to us what the world once was in all its glory. But human beings made in the image of God as the pinnacle of his creation with all their wonderful capacities. And it then relates the devastation wrought by the misuse of those capacities in disobeying the Word of God and in bringing sin and alienation into the world. The banishing from Eden, the trials of life, the increasing violence of human behavior that leads to the capital judgment of the flood with only the family of Noah saved to repopulate the planet. It's a pretty grim picture. And God starts again. This time by calling out a particular person, Abram, from the descendants of Noah to form a new nation that would live life God's way. And of course the major lesson, and the biggest lesson is that since sin entered the world through human failure to trust God and grasping at independence of God, the way back to God will involve learning to trust Him and His Word. And you know, it's immensely encouraging. As we study, we shall see some of the immense complexities of the way back to God. But we can stand back from this and be encouraged that a flawed men and women, like the three great patriarchs, and Abram in particular, can learn to trust God, then there's some hope for the rest of us. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest issue we face, the biggest pressure on us, is to undermine our confidence in God and His Word. That's number one. And the enemy will do anything he can to trip you up morally, but he'll do everything he can to undermine your confidence in the Word of God and His truth. That's why we have vast reams of history of Abraham and the patriarchs, because the key issue for them, in the midst of all the other issues of family and so on, the key issue was, am I going to trust God? And that will be the challenge to my heart and to yours. Well, where did he start? Well, we don't know a great deal about Abram's early life. But the book of Joshua tells us that Abram was an idol worshiper. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor. And they served other gods. That's the starting place. And we know far too little about it, really. And so speculation is rife. But at least we can ask the question, what is the nature of idolatry? Because God had to break its grip in Abram's life. Is it relevant to us? Yes, says John the Apostle. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. They may be things, forces, powers, false gods, ideas, but generally speaking, idols form that category of things that we 
trust rather than God. They can be things we love. Though many in the ancient world feared their idols, the key thing is it has to do with trust. And so it has to do with the central message of Abram's life. Now, of course, every day we have to trust people, doctors, dentists, institutions. But that does not mean we put our final trust in them. And there are many things, power, fame, wealth, health, education, sex, and so on, that become God's substitutes for many in our societies. But in the West, the dominant view of naturalism, its worldview, its central focus is its proud trust in the human mind and in its attribution of creative powers to nature, and that is as idolatrous as any of the idolatries of the ancient world. Because, of course, you will be aware that ancient Babylonian Mesopotamia, their gods were material gods, by which I mean that they had not simply cosmogenies, but theogenies. Their gods came out of the original mass energy or physics and chemistry of the universe. That is immensely important. As one writer put it, getting it exactly right, the gods of the ancient Near East were descended from the heavens and the earth. The God of the Bible created the heavens and the earth. That's the vast difference. And it is amusing when you debate people like Michael Shermer and so on, as they did in Oxford last year, and they come up with this argument, you know, you are an atheist with respect to Artemis Baal. They go through the alphabet and tell me I'm an atheist with regard to Zeus. And then they said, we just go one God more. What a childish comment that is. It shows they haven't a clue about the nature of the gods of the ancient Near East. Because all the gods I've just mentioned were products of the universe. The God of the Bible created the universe. And we need to emphasize that very strongly. Because what Genesis will be doing in the life of Abram is to move him from a worldview that deifies the basic forces of nature, as we would call them, projecting their images onto gods. And bring him to the worship of the true God who transcends space-time and who created the universe. And of course, this idolatry is um, the center of what happens in um, Genesis in the Garden of Eden. The temptation surrounded the human satisfaction of three desires, the basic appetite for food, the desire for ascetic satisfaction, and the intellectual desire for human flourishing. You shall be as God. And the subtlety of the talking snake, and that's another story. But you'll notice that the principal first attack on humanity was this. Has God said? Has God said? That's the attack. That's where it comes. If God can get you, if, if the enemy can get you to ask that question, has God said? You're well in the way to losing your compass. And what we need to do for one another at a conference like this, and I'm so delighted to be part of it in all the workshops, is to ram home the importance and the reasons that God can be trusted and we can have confidence in Him as we go out into a world which for some of you means that you're in a very extreme minority and it's very hard to keep your head above the parapet and to keep yourself straight. And so I trust that God will encourage us. So the central issue is this. Are we going to trust God in His Word? Or are we going to trust ourselves and our abilities? There is a danger of that, of course. You know, all of us in this room, I suspect, have had a very good education. And you know what one of the biggest dangers for us is? It's idolatry of the mind. You say, what's that? Idolatry of the mind, ladies and gentlemen, is where I trust my mind and my intellectual ability, and then I use God when I get stuck. Hmm. Christianity is when I trust God and use my mind. There's a vast world of difference. And there's a temptation for us 
especially if we've been given those kind of gifts, to subtly and increasingly trust our mind, our arguments, our abilities, and God gets crammed into a corner. And you can measure that by the amount of time we spend in Scripture, which we claim to believe and to teach. That's a challenge, isn't it? How can I possibly convince the world that the Bible is God's Word when I'm a bright person who spends five minutes a day or less reading it? I probably don't need to say that to you, but perhaps I do to some of the people that you're responsible for teaching. We need to wake up and get real about this. And that's why, and I'm so delighted to hear Stefan say it in his delightful way, the importance of beginning with the Word of God and letting it soak into our minds and hearts. Now, the universal project is the background to... Abram, the building of the great city. It is a fascinating genealogy because the genealogy of Shem is interrupted, of Noah is interrupted, and you get this little bit about um, Nimrod, the founder of Babel, who's said to be a first mighty man on the earth, a powerful hunter. And again, we know relatively little about him. Josephus held that it was Nimrod who excited the people of Shinar to such an affront and contempt of God. He said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again. And his idea was to build a city big enough that the flood, if it happened again, would never reach it. There's a very telling phrase. The beginning of his kingdom. Genesis starts with the words, in the beginning. That's the beginning of space-time, the universe. Now we come to another beginning, the beginning of secular power, we would call it, in the city of Babel, which was a very advanced project. There are hints earlier in Genesis about the beginnings of civilization. Cain, we're told, built a city called Enoch, and one of his descendants had a particularly talented family that developed agriculture, industry, music, and the arts. And these ancient people, as they migrated, say to one another, come, let us brick bricks, literally, and burn them to a burning. Let us build for ourselves a city with a tower with its head in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. And the word for name is Shem. This is all happening in the genealogy of Shem. Let us make a Shem for ourselves. What does that mean? You say, I'm here at this conference, and I'm looking for meaning. Of course we are. What is your name? What do you mean? The search for meaning is one of the most motivational searches that humanity knows. And we start with it. Let us make a name for ourselves, but somehow they were discontent. And this is making a name through the use of advanced, sophisticated human technology. We're right into the 21st century, of course. Harvey Cox, in his landmark book, The Secular City, written in 65, says, in our day, the secular metropolis stands as both the pattern of our life together and the symbol of our view of the world. And Leon Cass said, Babel is a new idea in Genesis. It's a redefining of what humanity means, and this is what the city does. Now, that is a topic for you to work out in your workshops. The secular city. Death in the city, as Francis Schaeffer once said. What is the city and what is its significance? Because, of course, a vast proportion of the earth now is living in cities, aren't they? And big towers. Have you noticed how the nations are competing to build the biggest thing into the sky they can? Fascinating, isn't it? Philip Noble, writing in The American, the most primal motivation for skyscraper construction is to stake a claim, to mark the land to show how your power can change the world, both physically and psychologically. Nothing says, I am master of the universe more clearly than the erection of a tall building. 
And if it can be taller than all the rest, so much the better. Before the Petronas Towers, no one knew where Kuala Lumpur was. Skyscrapers are made to make space. They are built to make money. But they are also built to make a point. They are built to awe. And when we do get our true mile-high tower in 2030 or sooner, one thing is certain, behind the financing, behind the army of workers, the engineers, the architects, there will stand a giant ego, personal, corporate, or national, but still requiring its likeness to be etched in the clouds. And the ideology of the modern skyscraper is the ideology of ancient Babylon. Identity, technological achievement, prowess, pushing out the boundaries, flaunting wealth and power, reaching for the sky, grasping at immortality. And the tower of Ziggurat in Babylon was called Etimananki, the house of the foundation of heaven and earth. It sought to link the city with the cosmos. At the level of rational investigation and plotting the stars, trying to predict the seasons, but then in trying to reach the heavens and to control its powers. Do you recognize this as motivation? The irony is that later in Scripture we read that the only thing in Babylon that reached to heaven was its sins. The ancient tower reached up towards heaven, but Genesis has a beautifully ironic comment. God had to come down to see what they were building. That's not bad, is it? <laughs> it didn't reach very high. God had to come down. There was an unbridgeable gap between God and their achievement, and we need to communicate that, ladies and gentlemen. Because the higher the skyscrapers go up, they think the less space is left for God. Because they feel that God resides in the gap between the height of the skyscraper and the dimension of heaven. And God commented in a chilling way on their capacity, nothing will be impossible to them. What does that mean? Does it mean that the project is feasible, but God will not allow it to happen? Well, at least we can see what God does. He doesn't destroy the city. He breaks its language down. Now, language plays a vital part in Genesis. By his word, God created. God said to them. By his word, he defines morality and relationship. And now, God does something that confuses their language. Because language creates unity and commonality. It is the foundation of order. And without common language, the common building project collapses. Since, as we know, in Europe even, the lack of common language causes all kinds of misunderstandings and frustrates the desire for control. Now, these are things we could develop right from now and stop at this. They're so important. The meaning of the city. Because can it all be wrong? Many of you work in cities. And we owe the city to the development of the million iPhones that there are in this room and all the rest of it. We're grateful for the city. Well, let's, before I stop now this morning, get to the opposite side of this to get it into proportion. The key statement is this. God speaks to a man called Abram. And he says, leave your country and your kindred. And I'll make a great nation of you. But then he says this, I will make your name great. Shem, your Shem, great. Now, this is it, isn't it? This is the message. It is actually something utterly fundamental. Because either... I'm trying to make my own name great or I'm allowing God to make my name great. Where do I generate significance? Is meaning something only we and we alone can create as Babel thought? Abram's called to trust God 
for meaning. And inside any of us, there can be a struggle even in this conference. We see walking around in this conference what we imagine to be great names. You know, so-and-so is great name, you know. Well, that may be as it may, but we need to be careful with that kind of talk, don't we? Because we can begin to feel insignificant. And the pressure then is to compete. You listen to a group of powerful people talking, and you can see subtly behind the scenes a pecking order is being established. You ever notice that? No, you wouldn't notice that, would you? And people pushing. And because I'm searching for my significance and you're searching for your significance, my significance sometimes means that I push my tower a bit higher than yours. In fact, I can't even see yours. And you can't even see mine because you feel yours is higher than mine already. And that can lead to a lot of hurt and pain, ladies and gentlemen. We need to be practical here. If this is what Abram was saved from, it must be real. And if this is the heart of the diagnosis given in Scripture, that Abram's coming out of this background, that is God is trying to get this background out of him. We may be sure that the way we build our lives and the way we search for our meaning is utterly central. It's a deep challenge, isn't it? And you see, if people say this is a negative attitude to the city, its culture, its agriculture, its infrastructure, its commerce, its financial systems, educational, and all the rest of it, and... My friends at IBM tell me we are now entering the age of the smart city, and it sounds utterly fascinating. What's wrong with that? And what is wrong with using your mind to develop these things? Absolutely nothing, as far as I can see. Absolutely nothing. There's nothing wrong with using the mind and trusting God. There's everything wrong with trusting the mind and using God. And that makes a practical difference. Now, does God not like cities? Is that what the message is? Now, listen carefully in case you misunderstand me. God is very interested in cities. Just listen to this. Now, this is something you don't learn in the Old Testament. But it's an analysis of Abram's motivation given in the New Testament. I'm going to read it to you. It's in Hebrews 11. For Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Then he goes through the other patriarchs and says, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. God is absolutely for cities. But you'll notice, ladies and gentlemen, that the final book in the Bible has got two cities won't you? There's, believe it or not, mystery, Babylon the Great. And there's the New Jerusalem. That's no accident, of course, because in a sense, the Bible is a tale of two cities. And it's not a question of which city you live in. It's a question of which city you live for. Daniel lived in Babel, in Babylon. Abram left it. But the secret of Daniel's life was he lived for the city, which is what? The foundations. And now we come near to what's going on here. Do you notice that in the description of Babel, the interest is all in the foundations? There was a city and a tower, and we think so much of the tower we forget that it had foundations. Now, what do we mean by that? Do you mean the kind of bricks or stone or steel or plastic? No, of course not. In the ancient world, as in the contemporary world, cities stand for ideologies. We used to use it in the radio. We've stopped doing it. But when I was young, centuries ago, I used to hear the radio, and it used to go like this, Moscow says, and Washington has responded, and Paris does... And they used the capital city 
as a metaphor for the ideology of the city philosophy behind it. So what we've got to ask ourselves is, what is the ideology that stands behind Babel? That is, what intellectual, moral, and spiritual foundations was it built on? That's the one side. And if God has prepared a city, what are its foundations? Abraham looked for the city which had foundations. So Abraham, according to Hebrews, knew about the foundations, not simply about the city. Well, I want to suggest to you that the simple answer is the obvious one. That the first and biggest foundation that was totally missing in Babel was trusting God for the foundation of life and meaning and significance. And life's journey was a following God as God said, come, and invited the man to leave that city on those foundations. Not to give up the idea of a city, but to think around conceptually about a totally new kind of city. Organized life, but organized around basic principles like that of trusting God. That's what the story's about. We have reached one of the mountaintops of Genesis. Abram has moved from being a naturalist, a pagan thinker. Step by step, he's moved in response to the voice of the living God. He's come to believe that there is a creator. He's come to believe that there is an owner, a possessor of heaven and earth. And now he stands, looking at the blazing hundred billion stars of our galaxy and listens to the voice that tells him that his offspring are going to be like that. And without any evidence physically that ever he will produce a child, he bows his head and he believes God. And the world changes. And countless millions, including us, in the 21st century have come to see that as the paradigm of faith and trust in God. And I want us to grasp a very simple thing. It's that it is possible for people to change their worldview. I debated Peter Singer in Australia in Melbourne Town Hall a couple of years ago. And I was honest with the audience and I told them that my parents were believers and so were my grandparents. And Peter got up and polite as he is, he said, well, of course, that's my biggest objection to the religious faith in general and Christianity. You see, people remain in the worldview in which they were brought up. So I thought this is going to be very interesting. So when he uh, gave the microphone to me, I said, Peter, I've told the audience about my parents, so would you like to tell us about your parents? Were they atheists? Yes, he said, they were atheists. Oh, I said, I see. You have remained in the worldview in which you were brought up. You've remained in the faith that your parents taught you. Oh, but he said, it isn't a faith. Oh, I said, I'm sorry, Peter. I thought you believed it. <laughs> now, that shows us, ladies and gentlemen, that one of the biggest battles we have in our contemporary culture is the definition of faith. What does it mean to believe? Because many of our atheist colleagues think that their atheism is not a belief system. Ours is a belief system, and they've redefined faith to mean believing where there's no evidence. That's dangerously wrong. And I want to emphasize that at the beginning today, that Abram's faith was not blind, it was not based on no evidence. He'd had Evidence building up constantly until this point. He had as yet no evidence that he would ever produce a child. 
but he had every evidence that God was trustworthy. And that is utterly crucial, that we realize that whatever the Christian faith is, it is not blind belief. It is commitment based on solid evidence. And part of it is, of course, the story of Abraham. Now, this matter of faith is so important because there's great religious confusion in our world about faith. So, let me read, first of all, the New Testament analysis of what happened to Abram. Romans 4, verse 1. What shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if he was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abram believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, here's the crucial statement. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, his wages are not, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. We need to be absolutely clear that works and faith are regarded as opposites. Faith is not a work. It is not a contribution to salvation. And it is not that we have the faith to do the works that will grant us acceptance. Because, of course, if our works were adequate, God would be obliged to give us justification. It would no longer be an act of grace any more than it would be an act of grace for an employer to give an employee the wages she had earned. And it's this that brings peace with God, the realization that receiving salvation is not contributing to salvation. Receiving God's gift, and it was that that transformed the life of Abram. But Abram was human, like we are, and he wanted to be sure. And we want to be sure, don't we? It's only when we have a secure basis for faith. It's only when we've got confidence in God that we can go out and face the world. And I see, in my advanced age, even older than the old man who sat beside Yeri all those years ago, I see that one of the basic problems is confidence in God. Because faith and confidence are very closely related. And the moment our confidence in God is undermined, we lose the central drive and motivation for communicating the gospel to the world. And so Abram raised the question. God said to him, I'm going to give you this land to possess and your offspring. And there he was without a child, his wife barren. And he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And God didn't dismiss his request for certainty and assurance, but did something that spins up towards us through history and is of utterly fundamental importance. He made a covenant with Abraham. It's a very odd story, isn't it? Uh, God said to Abraham, bring me a heifer three years old. Well, how on earth is that an answer to how can I know? Bring a heifer and a few other animals. And he brought them and he was told to cut them all in half. I don't know whether that's the way you help people with assurance, but that's the way God helped Abraham. He cut all these animals into halves and put a little pile of animals against each other so there was space in between. What's going on here? This is the ancient notion of what it means to cut a covenant. The word for covenant in Hebrew, berit, comes from bara, to cut, to cut a covenant. And the idea is very simple. 
It is this, suppose, oh, well, Yuri will do. Yuri and I are going to do a deal. And I'm going to sell him my house. So we agree the price. And I agree to pay him $1,000. Um, <clears throat> and he's going to sell me his house. Now, what happens then is once we've agreed it, we get these little piles of animals, and Yuri walks between them, and I walk between them. What's the idea of that? The idea is very simple, but it's very graphic. What we're saying is, do that to me if I don't keep the terms of the agreement. It's very simple, isn't it? You've got it, have you? You cut me in pieces if I don't pay you the money and you don't give me the house. Now, the important thing to see is that both Yuri and I have got conditions to fulfill. So we both walk between the pieces. And you know, in the Old Testament, we have a reference to that. Not to Abram's covenant, but the, to the covenant at Sinai. And Jeremiah 34 says this, The men who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walk between its pieces. That's blunt, isn't it? Now, here's the very interesting thing. Just listen to what happened. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And then the Lord said to Abram, No, for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that's not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterwards they will come out with great possession. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And when the sun had gone down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking firepot and flaming torch passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord God made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Abram did not pass between the pieces. He was asleep, actually. God did. Now, that is dramatic, and it is vastly important that we grasp it. That in Scripture, the word covenant covers two fundamentally distinct concepts. It covers the notion that we usually use the word agreement for, where there are two parties involved. But there's another legal document which affects all of us. It's called a will or a testament, and only one party is involved. If I leave you something in my will, you don't have to earn it. All you have to do is receive it. You have no conditions to fulfill. And this is how God gave Abram certainty. Because this, this covenant, this agreement was like a testament. It was God committing himself to fulfill everything. And all Abraham had to do was to trust God. It's magnificent, you know. And on it hangs all our salvation. Because this is how the Bible explains to us how we can be certain. It's what gives us stability as we face the world. It's a one party, a monopluric covenant, a testament, as distinct from what happened at Sinai. 430 years later, another covenant, but there both parties had to go through the paces as we've just read from Jeremiah. Now, let's have the New Testament comment on this in Hebrews chapter 8. If there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, not the one with Abraham, the one at Sinai, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them 
by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Why? Because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them. It had two sides, two parties. It was a diploric covenant. That's the difference, and we're all involved. It's crucial that we realize that coming down from the days of Abram, our security lies in that new covenant made on the cross where God fulfilled the conditions. And all I have to do is to trust Him. When peace like a river overflows my soul, what a fantastic gospel it is. It's utterly unique, which is why the religious mind finds it very difficult to grasp. Because our whole mindset, our whole education, our whole knowledge of life is you only get what you earn and what you deserve. And God comes into the situation and says, you cannot earn it, so I'm going to do something utterly unique. You know, these are basic things, but we need to remind ourselves of them. And I believe that they figure so prominently in the New Testament because it's this story, above all, that helps us understand it. Now, listen to the New Testament again, pointing that Abram's security lies in the fact that once the covenant is ratified, it cannot be altered by any subsequent action. To give a human example, Galatians 3 says, Paul, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now, the promises were made to Abram and to his offspring. It doesn't say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law which came for 30 years afterwards does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abram by a promise. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abram's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Nothing can alter the fact that your name is written effectively into that original covenant that we're reading about. So we are involved. I know it's all surrounded by legalese, but my, I would like to know, ladies and gentlemen, notice what the promise said you're going to be heir of the world. Do you believe that? That's very concrete, isn't it? Of course, Abram was told, first of all, just about the land, but we'll not fault God for extending it to the entire world, will we? If uh, I contract with a builder to build a house, a modest house, and when I receive it, it's got a gold-plated bathroom and a swimming pool and a sauna and everything else. And I, I say, but look, I didn't. Oh, he said, don't worry, you don't have to pay for this. I decided to just to be generous. <laughs> well, you wouldn't complain, would you? I think we need to take this seriously. God is the owner of this planet, ladies and gentlemen. Do you think this planet can throw its creator out and never hear anything more about him? Oh, it's big stuff, isn't it? Oh, I know, there are going to be new heavens and a new earth. God isn't physics, finished with physics and chemistry. That's old Greek philosophy that teaches that. Don't you know, said Paul, to some Christians fighting with one another like children? Don't you know that the saints will rule the world? Not unto angels has he subject the world to come where off he speak, but somewhere someone has said, what is man that you are mindful of him? That's the inheritance. It's not simply salvation. It's inheriting the world. Is that big enough for you? I think it's important, and I haven't time to do it in detail, but it's important that we grasp this. 
that the promise to Abraham, and I'm reading Paul, Romans 4 again, that he would be heir of the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. There are untold exciting things waiting for us. I'm not going to unpack it, I'm going to leave it to you. Because we've got to move on. But let's notice at this juncture, standing on the mountain, trusting God, the man is assured, utter assurance. I meet so many people in middle life, and they've never really grasped this, even as Christians. They're constantly trying to earn their acceptance with God. They haven't understood the gospel. That the whole basis is that God does us something, and all we have to do is receive it and not earn it. It needs to permeate our souls, doesn't it? Because sometimes we get so confused, we feel that it's our Christian work that's earning us acceptance with God. And we're stressed to pieces from inside out because we're driven by uncertainty. And it's worth asking ourselves, just individually, am I driven by certainty or uncertainty? To know that we're accepted by God, quite independent of who we are, is one of the biggest things in life, isn't it? That's what keeps life stable. But now we come to the negative lesson. I wish I didn't have to talk about this, but in a way, it is so important because Abram had to learn positively what it means to trust God. He had to learn negatively not to trust himself and what the New Testament calls the flesh. And now we have three from chapter 16 to 19, which have to do with the topic of the flesh from two perspectives. Our flesh is a very tricky thing because there's religious flesh. And then there's the other side, the seamy, immoral type of flesh. We meet both of them. The stories are obvious in a way. God has promised a child, and Sarah hasn't got a child. So she thinks up a scheme of how to get a child. I mean, after all, God needs a bit of help. We've got to be realistic about these things. God has promised it, so it obviously it means that we need to look around for solutions to this intractable gynecological problem. So she looked around, and according to the custom of the day, the best idea was surrogacy. Interestingly, that that idea is introduced, isn't it? That needs a big discussion, doesn't it? But it was acceptable at the time. So she took her Egyptian maid, and she puts a lovely spiritual gloss on it, doesn't she? She goes to her husband, Abraham, and she said, the Lord has prevented me from having children. So it sounds very spiritual, doesn't it? And so she suggests that Abram takes Hagar, the Egyptian servant girl, as wife, in order to have children. The text says, interestingly, and Abram listens to his wife. That little phrase occurs in Genesis 3.17 and nowhere else. This is a rerun of the fall, ladies and gentlemen. Her offering her husband the fruit where God said no. Her now offering her husband the fruit where, ah, but the text leaves us open. Is surrogacy a good thing? Or is the introduction of foreign genetic material a thing that can cause endless trouble? I leave you to judge from history. The text does not comment. It's a rerun of the fall. The same issues. And that's why Leon Cass says, Genesis tells you in one sense what once happened, but it tells you what always happened, because we're always being brought up to this question. 
And then, in another way, it's a mirror image of the account of Abram denying Sarah in Egypt in the previous section. There, Abram asked Sarai to deny her true relationship with him, and she obliged and was taken as a partner for Pharaoh. Here, she's prepared to deny her true relationship as Abram's wife and encourages him to take a, another partner, an Egyptian. And it's this time, it's Abram who obliges Sarah. In Egypt, he was moved by fear, the desire for wealth. Here, she's moved by feelings of shame at her barrenness. And in neither episode do Abram or Sarai show any interest in their own future as husband and wife. The episodes are moved and motivated by calculation rather than lust. Sarai had hoped to be built up by the child, but when Hagar got pregnant, she despised Sarah. Introducing Alien genetic material is a massive bioethical problem in our age, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm glad there are experts here who are busied with it. It's one of a complex of very difficult problems. Because I do not want to sound remotely unsympathetic to women whose makeup physically has prevented them from having children. The desire to have a child is a very deep thing. It's part of the creation order, isn't it? And we must show every sympathy to those whose natural expectation in life has not been fulfilled. But we need to take this story seriously. Solving the problem in the energy of the flesh, in the way in which we think is wise, retrospectively isn't always seen to be the best thing. And of course, instead of simplifying life and realizing God's purposes, they learn, Abram and Sarah, a bitter lesson of what can go wrong when you use others as instruments to further your ends rather than treat them as people with significance in their own right. We need to have a lot of sympathy for Hagar, ladies and gentlemen. God did. He didn't dismiss her or ignore her. And Abram tried to get rid of the problem by telling Sarai to do what she liked, hoping this will calm her fury. But it doesn't. She overreacts. She deals harshly with Hagar and sends her away. What a tragedy. Hagar's lost her home. Sarai's lost her maid. Abram's lost his wife that's produced his child. There's a big lesson, isn't there? Harshness. Injustice are no way to deal with the consequences of my own wrongdoing. And isn't it so true to life that when we do something wrong, we can so easily overreact and damage others and injure them to crawl our way out of it when the whole thing is proceeding from our own self-pity and our own knowledge that we are the ones that have done the wrong. And Hagar's supply runs out, and she despairs. Who can she turn to? Perhaps she was already having thoughts of returning. After all, she knew how Abram felt about his son. He loved him. And then she hears the voice. Where have you come from? God inquiring after the geographic location of a person has only happened once before in the Garden of Eden. Where are you, Adam? Where have you come from? Hager's learning about Psalm 139, which I love, and Sally does too. You know my down-sitting and my uprising. Hager discovered that this God was interested in her, not simply in Abram. He was interested in her, and we mustn't forget it. Theologically, we mustn't forget it, that when the New Testament uses Hagar as a metaphor, that is saying nothing about the fact that God was interested in her spiritually and physically. And indeed, God promised to bless Ishmael when he was born, and out of him would come a vast 
nation. Sarah called upon the Lord to judge, and he did, and he sent Hagar back. And for 13 years, what a household. Can you imagine it? Do you know, the Chinese ideogram for trouble is two women in a house. <laughs> I wonder why. Well, if ever there was an exposition of it, here it is. 13 years, and it wasn't simply two women in a house. It was, well, it was a young man who was described as a wild ass of a man. Untamable. And perhaps Abram secretly admired him. He certainly had great hopes for him because eventually, when he still hadn't a child, he said to God, oh, that Ishmael can live before you. Abram was impressed with Ishmael. There was something wild and untamable, something pioneering about the man's spirit. And Abram was building up his hopes that this is going to be the man with the spunk and the oomph to go out into the world and pioneer this new movement. But he was wrong. So they had a rough time. They had to learn about the flesh. And so do you and I. Isn't it interesting that the New Testament follows exactly this pattern? When Paul in Romans has discussed justification by faith, instead of it all leading to absolute glory and wonder, it leads to a horrific struggle inside Paul with the old flesh. And we all know about that. And we all have to learn it. We all have to learn what Paul once said, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. You feeling like that? You know, there's nothing more debilitating. You've been a Christian many years, and then you suddenly find you're repeating a sin. And you struggle, and the old flesh rises up, and there it goes again, and there it goes again, and you begin to despair. Do you know anything about that? Of course, we all do. And Abram had to learn, and we have to learn. And the wonderful thing is that God has something to do with it, because God, in chapter 17, appears to Abram, and he says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Notice he didn't say, you are Abraham Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I know you laugh, but I hope you get the point. Because that's what we sometimes feel, you know. Do you notice the metaphor that's being used? It's to do with walk, and it comes at exactly the right point in Abram's experience according to the New Testament analysis. Because what is it that Paul teaches us? That we are to walk after the Spirit, relying on the power of God Almighty. That's what the New Testament begins to teach us. And I have to learn it, and you have to learn it. Abram learns about the struggles in the same order as Paul. He thought his own strength was enough to fulfill the promises of God, and he found his flesh was insufficient, even as a man who believed God, insufficient to work it out. Before we came to Christ and were saved, we couldn't please God through the flesh, and it's exactly the same after we come to trust Christ. And so here is now God's introduction to his answer to this question. But I say, says Paul in Galatians, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. There's an act of walking which fights against the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And so God began to teach Abram lessons about his method of dealing with the flesh. And my, is it a bit of an uncomfortable lesson. It has to do with circumcision. 
which again is not a topic that I feel particularly comfortable about talking about. But we've got to face what Scripture says about it because this is one of the angular concepts. What on earth has circumcision, a physical mark in the flesh, got to do with walking before God and being perfect? It seems so incongruous. But here again, a bit of effort will repay us because the notion of circumcision is used in five or six different ways in Scripture. You better fasten your seatbelts because this is going to be very quick. (laughs) It was, first of all, a covenant with Abram regarding his physical posterity, not that of Genesis 15. The New Testament points out that circumcision, since it happened afterwards, cannot affect that original covenant. Here was a special nation, physically marked out, a nation that produced the Messiah. Secondly, Romans tells us that circumcision is a seal of the righteousness of faith that Abram had while he was still uncircumcised. That's so important. He was first justified and then circumcised 13 years later. So his justification had nothing to do with the physical right of circumcision. That ceremony did not convey the spiritual reality. Thirdly, it was a sign of membership in Abram's tribe that did not make them spiritual children of Abraham. Indeed, circumcision, even if you had it, did not in every case mean recognition of a person within that special tribe. Ishmael was circumcised. Fourthly, it was a symbol for Israel the danger of ceremony without spiritual content. You stiff-necked people, said Stephen, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Oh my, I'd like to have time to unpack this. What confusion there is in this world with the idea that physical ritual conveys spiritual regeneration and reality. So many people are confused about the relationship of rite and ritual to salvation. I sometimes illustrate it this way. Do you see that ring? It has meaning if I married. I could wear a hundred of them and even through my nose. But they wouldn't make me married. The symbol has validity if the reality stands behind it. It's exactly the same here. But unfortunately, many came to regard circumcision and keeping the law of Moses as the means of salvation when the very right cutting off the flesh was meant to teach the exact opposite. It was a pretty blunt and graphic way of reminding Abram where not to put his trust. I leave you to work that out. I'm putting it as delicately as I can, ladies and gentlemen. And it was meant, it's a brilliant metaphor actually once we see what's going on, it was meant to indicate the abandonment of all trust in the flesh in the moral sense. Listen to this, now here's the key verse. For we are the circumcision, says Paul, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. That is the major lesson that it was meant to teach. Every confidence in God, he believed God and it was counted to him in righteousness. But now he's got to, and I've got to learn the negative lesson, no confidence in the flesh. That's a very difficult lesson to learn. All of us brilliant people, gifted beyond the majority, so easy to put confidence in the flesh. And it's disastrous, of course, when we go out to face a world that's alien and antagonistic. So easy to trust your brains, your wealth, whatever kind it is, intellectual, spiritual, physical. No confidence in the flesh. And the reason it's possible to do this is, again, Old Testament, Deuteronomy 30, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. Here it comes. There is a reality 
that corresponds to the right of circumcision. It is circumcision of the heart. It's not a physical ritual at all. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul that you may live. You see, my unregenerate heart cannot make itself love God. If ever I'm going to love God, I must be cut loose from the flesh and planted in the Spirit. And here we come to another pair of concepts. Paul talks about us being by nature in the flesh. And the wonderful thing that God does when we come to trust Christ He takes us from being rooted in the flesh and he plants us in the Spirit. And our responsibility is there ever after to walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Because the problem is this, that although we're no longer in the flesh, it's putrefying there and it's so easy for us to walk after the flesh. Therefore, says Paul, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith. And he goes on to say, in Him also you were circumcised. Well, what kind of circumcision? Was some physical right? No. Notice how carefully he says it. With a circumcision not made with hands. I hope you've noticed that. All rituals, dare I say baptism included, are made with hands. Have you ever seen anybody being baptized without somebody using their hands? This is far deeper than that. This is the circumcision of Christ. And what's it telling me? Something glorious that when I trusted him, a cut was made deep down in my being that cut out that rootedness in the flesh and implanted me in the Spirit. This is a spiritual reality. And it is God's provision. With all the trips and falls and everything else, it's God's provision for us. And so Abraham got to the state where God announced once more that he would have a son. And Abram falls down laughing. Shall a child be born to a man of a hundred and a woman of ninety? Oh, that Ishmael may live before you. Well, no. You're going to have a child. But unfortunately, the matter of the flesh is not finished. And they have to learn it from another direction. And it has to do with the famous visit of the angels and the Lord to Abram and the question of the judgment of the most fleshly city in the ancient world, Sodom. You see, we've got to judge the religious flesh. That's subtle and difficult because we're so well-meaning, we want to use all our energies for the Lord, and so easily we slip from trusting Him. But this other thing we've got to judge too. You see, Lot had been rescued by Abram, but he'd gone back to Sodom. He'd had another chance, hadn't he? And the Lord appears to Abraham, and in chapter 18, there's a very elaborate meal done with brilliant Middle Eastern understatement where Abram entertains two angels and what is obviously the Lord himself. Hospitality is the thing that opens the door onto this second half of our section. And hospitality is going to be the theme because Sodom is going to stand as the most horrific abuse of hospitality that you can ever imagine. And Abram entertains the Lord and his angels. That is a wonderful thing, isn't it? To fellowship with God. Things are moving upwards up on the plateau and the mountains of his life, and he's now able to entertain God, and God comes to his tent, and they have a bit of a discussion, and he tells Abram, when Sarah's outside the door, that he's going to, Sarah's going to have a child. And Sarah starts to laugh, and the angels call her in. (laughs) 
You did laugh. No, I didn't laugh. But of course you laughed. And that word laughter is going to become the name of the son. Yitzhak, he laughs. And that's going to have significance as well. And then two angels leave, and Abram stands in this awesome conversation. I don't really know what to make of it. Where God, the moral governor of the universe, starts to talk to a human what he's going to do about judging the cities of the plain. I mean, just imagine what this is if we take it seriously. God is inviting his comment, having an ethical discussion with this man. And God said, um, I will go down and see Sodom. The echo of Babel is obvious, isn't it? Babel wasn't high enough to reach heaven, nor was Sodom. Although the sins of both were reaching heaven. And I'll see if it's as bad as it is. And Abram raises the question, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Is it going to be indiscriminate justice? And he starts bargaining with God and arguing the numbers down. Would you, would you destroy the city for 40? Well, what about 30? What about 20? And he leaves off at 10. Why well, left off at 10? I don't know. Because it raises deep ethical problems, doesn't it? Because if you save the city for the sake of ten, that means the unrighteous are not punished at all, doesn't it? What level of ethics is this, you think? Well, I leave that to the ethical experts, but you do need to think about it. God discussing, dealing with our planet, with a human. Is that just a little hint, ladies and gentlemen? I don't know. Abram's seed to rule the world. It's, as C.S. Lewis once said, the New Testament rustles. All its leaves rustle with the expectation of eternity. There's something big going on here, and I just feel too small to really cope with it. So God says, for the sake of ten, I won't destroy it. And then the scene moves to Sodom, the hypersexualized city, I've called it. It is a tragic story, an utterly tragic story. They come to the gate of Sodom, they encounter the wickedness and tragedy of Sodom. Lot had become a judge in Sodom. Do you notice the repetition of the concept of judgment here? Sarah says, the Lord judge between you and me. Abram, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And Lot, he's worked himself into the city administration of Sodom, hoping to do something. Now, we've got to get this clear. We wouldn't have known this except for the New Testament, which says Lot was a righteous man and he vexed his soul. Wow. What a tragedy is Lot. Profoundly unhappy, tormented, probably since the day he separated from Abram. The city had destroyed his moral compass. He could see that homosexual rape was horrific, but his alternative was to deny the last vestige of fatherhood and offer his virgin daughters to the sex-enraged men who were clustered round the door. And he's a believer. Lot clicked his way into Sodom, and it destroyed him. He pleads with the angels who say, you've got to get out. He speaks to his children. They don't listen. And the angels have to drag him out. And he still wants to stay. He said, look, let me stay in this little city, Tsoar. It is a little city. He can't get away from it. And the angels allow his request. What a denial of moral reality. And you know the New Testament comment is grim reading. Here it is. 2 Peter tells us that the rescue of Lot shows that the Lord is able to deliver the righteous. 
For after a description of God's rescuing various people and dealing with judgment, he said, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then that proves what? That the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. But let us be warned. God rescued him from a disastrous situation. He could not remove the consequences. Lot loses everything, family, home, career, wealth, reputation. He thought he could protect the Lot by going to Sodom. He was saved, though, as though by fire, literally. Remember those solemn words of Paul? that the day will come when our works and our lives will be assessed. Not in order to get into heaven or not. If any man's work is burned up, says Paul, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are his temple. Ladies and gentlemen, it matters what we do with our bodies. What a horrific lesson. And you know, Abraham didn't know that Lot was being rescued. The next we read of Abraham, he's standing up on a hill and he watches the smoke and the fire and the brimstone devouring the whole place and he thinks Lot's gone, of course. What would you have felt if you'd been Abraham? Was it my fault? You ever felt like that? That your influence and somebody else has led them to disaster? It was partly Abram's fault, wasn't it? It must have been a marvelous thing when Abram learned that Lot had been rescued, but oh, at what cost? Because Lot's daughters were interested in posterity, posterity even though he wasn't. And they committed incest and produced Moab and Ammon who caused endless trouble in the years to come. And I close with this. Likewise, said Jesus, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But in the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who's on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. She turned back. She couldn't let it go. And she was engulfed in the brimstone and the sulfur and turned into a pillar of salt. What a battle it is. I would despair, wouldn't you, if we didn't have a relationship with God Almighty. I want to read from Scripture, Genesis chapter 11 and verse 31. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go! from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all, the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord 
have told him. There's an enigma at the start of this story. Because it would seem that Abram's father began the journey with his son and with Lot and with their wives. And the question arises, when was it that God first spoke to Abram to call him on this journey? The way I read it, it appears that he was called in Haran. But there's an alternative translation which translates it with a pluperfect in chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram. It is the fact that when Stephen was giving his famous speech that resulted in his death as the first Christian martyr, he started it with these words, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. So was he called twice or what? Well, I just don't know. The important thing, therefore, is not exactly when he was called, but what it was that got him started on this journey. Did Abraham go in blind faith? Or was there a reality behind the start of this journey? Because this, of course, is the first great follow me in history. And it seems to me the primary thing here is this. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. That is, it was a vision, an experience of God that impelled him to start this pilgrimage. It wasn't blind faith. It was the exact opposite of blind faith. It was a result of seeing something more glorious even than the culture of Mesopotamia into which he'd been born. And it was a glorious culture, as you will see if you go to the British Museum. Glittering in their advance in science and art and music and medicine and everything else. This was high culture. And what impelled Abram to move was seeing a God of glory who was even bigger than that. And the interesting thing is that when Stephen mentioned this in Jerusalem, the God of glory appeared to our father Abram. There was sitting listening a young man. His name was Saul. And at the end of that second section of the book of Acts, that same God of glory appeared to that young man on the way to Damascus and a light shone above the brightness of the midday sun and told him to go. And there are the two sides of our story. Abram saw the glory of God and he left that civilization to form the nation of Israel. And now Paul, listening to Stephen and being affected and eventually encountering the risen Christ, sees the same glory and it impels the mission, the result of which is that you and I are sitting here this morning. One of the biggest events in history, ladies and gentlemen, is that that man who sat and listened to Stephen brought the gospel to Europe. And so we are in his debt as well as, of course, to his Lord. And the major message is clear, isn't it? If ever we're going to go, if ever we're going to go on a pilgrimage that influences the world, the one absolutely essential thing is that we see the glory of God. That's more than doing Bible study to prepare for sermons, you know. One of the dangers of busy, active people in Christian work is that they spend all of their time preparing things for other people. And they do not seek God in their study of His Word. It's worth asking ourselves, why do we study the Word of God? Is it because they've got talks to give? Well, maybe. But ultimately, we need to learn to seek God 
in his word so that we hear his voice. And then we're going to have something to say to the world. So the first message this morning is the thing that impelled Abraham and I trust will impel us. Now, of course, he might have fought for years, hidden years of questioning, of thinking, because he was clearly a brilliant man. And it is fascinating to imagine what might have happened. Do you know there's a Jewish legend about Terah being an idol maker? And Abram one day came in and broke up all the idols, leaving only the biggest idol. And claiming to his father, when asked to account for the devastation in the idol-making factory, what went wrong? Oh, says Abram, the idols fought with one another. And Terah said, but idols can't fight because they're lifeless. Well, then why do you worship them, said Abram? And however much that story may be true or false, it has a point, doesn't it? The absurdity of idol worship. And perhaps it was the father had begun to see something and had got up in the journey sharing the vision of the son, but he got stuck for years in Haran because the vision for the father was not firsthand. For Abram, it was firsthand. We need a firsthand vision, don't we? We need to see the glory of the Lord. And you know, as you analyze Scripture, you see that anybody that did anything, anybody that did anything, was someone who'd seen the glory of the Lord. We beheld His glory. Is my God big enough to take me on a journey that's going to be significant for the world, because it's only the glory of God that can break the grip of civilized, sophisticated idolatry, whose adherents then as now have no idea that there's anything more glorious than the world of art, science, culture, medicine, and engineering. But Abram was about to discover that behind this universe there was a person A living, vibrant, creator person who had made Abram and the rest of us for himself, who wanted Abram to enjoy his love and fellowship, and who had prepared for Abram a city. The God who called then can still call now. Dare we hope that before our conference is over, there'll be some of you who will have heard that voice in such an unmistakable way that life's new path will be opened up to you to change your focus, to change your life's work. So Abram set out on the journey and he went to the land of Canaan and I'd love to have known what kind of a journey it was because from Haran to Canaan was about 21 days if you had camels with you, which I believe they did, but that's another story. And the interesting thing is, very little is said. There were Canaanites in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram, and he built an altar, and he moved his tent, and he built an altar, and he moved his tent. What an interesting reversal of the normal concept of life. What have you built? Well, possibly a house or a flat. But for Abram, the tent was moved. There was no trace of it when he moved. The things that were permanent were the altars he built. That is, his life was dotted with experiences of God that were so real that he commemorated them with something utterly solid. It's an interesting reversal of the common philosophy that we build solid buildings and put our name on them to commemorate us. Abram didn't. The shifting tent, the permanency of his experiences of God. Look back over life. Do you see altars strewn through your life and dotted about? Those experiences of God that shaped you, that determined your identity, that moved you. Now, Abram was being guided by God, and now a famine struck. 
And Abram learned that even if you're guided by God, this earth doesn't guarantee you to be comfortable all the time. And he had to face famine and lack of food. So they moved down towards Egypt, and that created a problem. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. That was a nice thing to say to his wife. <laughs> and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. So say you are my sister, that it might go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. The first recorded words in Scripture of a human being have to do with his wife. This at last, said Adam, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The text then goes on to define marriage. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The first recorded words of Abram also concern his wife, when he suggests her denying their true marriage relationship. The problem for Abram was not the existence of his wife, but her beauty. He's been promised a great future by God. He hopes to thrive. He's into well-being. And so now he's got to make a value decision. He puts thriving, his own immediate self-preservation and material wealth above honesty and truth and the ethics of marriage. Did he think that the promise of God meant that his well-being was now the chief value? So that it meant that he could essentially sacrifice his wife by asking her to go along with a half-truth. Well-being is one of the major idols of our time. Isn't it? Two billion hits on Google. A major value in people's minds, whatever value means. A major subject of academic study, with millions hanging on every word. What is well-being? And this text raises the question. We Christians should be interested in it, shouldn't we? shaping concepts of well-being. And we should be aware, shouldn't we, of studies like those done by Andrew Sims, the past president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Britain. I quote, the advantageous effect of religious belief and spirituality on mental and physical health is one of the best kept secrets in psychiatry and medicine generally. If the findings of the huge volume of research on this topic had gone in the opposite direction, and it had been found that religion damages your mental health, it would have been front page news in every newspaper in the land. Have we got anything to say about well-being into our contemporary society? Listen to an atheist, a well-known atheist, Matthew Paris, Writing about his experience of Africa, he says this, those who want Africa to walk tall amid 21st century global competition must not kid themselves that providing the material means or even the know-how that accompanies what we call development will make the change. A whole belief system must first be supplanted. And I'm afraid that it has to be supplanted by another. Now listen to this. Removing Christian evangelism from the African equation may leave the continent at the mercy of a malign fusion of Nike, the witch doctor, the mobile phone, and the machete. Well-being. And the crudeness and the low level of the conversation between Abram and Sarai leads us to wonder, first of all, about Abram's understanding of the concept of God. You see, it's very easy to assume that Abraham was a dear evangelical Christian, well taught and trained in every school of theology you know. This was a raw pagan now beginning to grapple with the big issues of the world. 
And one of the biggest issues is the concept of a wife. Don't laugh too quickly, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Abram clearly expected the Egyptians to take Sarai, and they did. Pharaoh's natural desire for a beautiful addition to his harem created immense difficulty. And you'll notice that the issue has to do with beauty and aesthetics. That's how sin entered into the world in the first place, isn't it? When she saw God has given us an aesthetic sense, and that's magnificent. But the enemy can use it. Listen to Leon Kass, a Jewish commentator. God cares for Sarai, but especially for Sarai as Abram's wife. The attentive reader may learn from this story that although one may choose a wife, one cannot choose what wife means. Do you hear that? Although one may choose a wife, one cannot choose what wife means. A wife is not transmutable into a sister or a concubine when it suits one's purpose. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't have to remind you that the world is altering the definition of what wife means. Abram one day will have to learn what being a father means. But in order to do that, he must learn the meaning of wife, which is clearly another foundation principle of God's city. Witness the metaphor. When the city is ultimately seen in the book of Revelation, it comes down from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. It's a holy city. Its values are rooted in the character of God. And Abram has to learn those lessons as we do at the base level of what it means to be a wife and what it means to be a husband. It's important that there are seminars and such things at this conference, isn't it? Let me ask myself the question as you ask you, self. What is my concept of a wife? What does it mean to me? How do I express that meaning? Let me look back over the past year. How have I treated my wife? How has our relationship developed? Or have I neglected her? If I'm honest, and it's hard to be honest, what would my wife say to me? If I asked her to tell me what she thought wife meant to me, am I struggling here? Do I need to repent? You see, Abram seemed of no sense that his mission was a joint venture with Sarah. He had no notion of being joint heirs of the grace of life. And what about us? We're involved in ministry. We have a vision and a sense of calling. Do we consult our wives about what we do? I would never accept an invitation that hasn't first run past my wife. Because one of the things that is so important is that we function as a team. And we don't assume, oh, well, she'll understand that. That's my work, and so on and so forth. Or do we just charge ahead and take on all kinds of things without it ever occurring to us that our wives might help us here? My wife's been through every word of this, these talks, ladies and gentlemen. She spent hours. Does that surprise you? Do you do that? Do you know, I find it hard to imagine that Abram and Sarai prayed together about this. <laughs> but then realism tells me that there are many wives and husbands who never pray together. When did you last pray with your wife and your husband? Or read the Scriptures together? How can we expect to minister for God if that's the case. I don't know you all. I'm speaking to my own heart. But I talk to so many people 
who are active in ministry, who are household names, and they're not praying daily with their wives. And we lose power and authority there. This is a journey, this journey of faith, and it's deeply practical. So the first thing, Abram, to learn, the painful way, is what is the meaning of the wife-husband relationship? Now, this is very practical, but my wife's here, so I have to be practical or I'll get into trouble. (laughs) Reading Scripture. Well, you know, every month my wife sends out about 30 copies of Our Daily Bread to husbands and wives around the place. You'd be amazed who some of them are. We've seen marriages healed. They're simple notes. Our Daily Bread. There's a little app. You can get it for nothing. Oh, but you say it's not high-powered and philosophical. No, it isn't, and therefore you're more likely to read it together. (laughs) To do something is infinitely better than to do nothing. Today, this morning, the verses where God is a God of all comfort, and I find that powerfully reassuring as I come to minister to you. And again and again we find in those simple notes that they're totally opposite to what happens in the day. Oh, well, you found something else marvelous, as long as you do it. It's a big learning curve, isn't it? Of course, what I've said about husbands learning about wives, it's the same the other way around. What does the wife conceive her husband to be? And you see, here's the problem. Abram's action in not acknowledging or cleaving to his wife, that's another problem, isn't it? When wives don't leave, and men don't leave their father and mother, that can create endless problems, but I'm not going on to those now. But Abram's disobedience to Scripture led to enormous financial wealth. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because now we're entering into another major topic here. The question that stands before us is the relation of well-being and material well-being in particular to the value of persons and relationships. It's a fundamental thing in God's city. One of the foundation principles is learning that people are more valuable than things. And it took a lot of learning. And as you know, Pharaoh took Sarai We don't know whether he slept with her or not. Jewish commentators mostly think that he did. And you will remember that Abram, in the next episode, slept with an Egyptian called Hagar. It's an entangled world. It's a complex world. Others feel, and they may be right, that she was put into the harem and had to wait her turn, so to speak. And by the time her turn came, God plagued Pharaoh's house and got him to realize that she was a person's wife. And you notice that Pharaoh rebuked him and said, what is this you've done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say that she was my sister and I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. The moral level of the pagan was higher than Abraham. That is a very big lesson isn't it? How easy it is to look down on people that do not share our worldview. And until we learn that every man and woman is a moral being created in the image of God and therefore morally is capable of putting any of us to shame, we'll not be able to relate to those of other faiths and to discuss the differences because they will think in every conversation that we're simply talking down to them from a superior position. Better to be rebuked by a non-Christian or a pagan than not to be rebuked at all. But how embarrassing. Here's the man who's going to be the flag bearer for the testimony of God in the world. And the first world leader he... He meets, boots him out for dishonesty and misrepresentation. That's a terrific start, isn't it? Mm. I just get amazed at how basic this is and how crude some of it is, actually, as you get down to it. 
Abram got afraid and denied a relationship. Have you ever done that? Oh, you say, I've never denied my wife. Well, just be careful. Some men can flirt and effectively deny their wives and cause an awful lot of trouble. And women can do it too. But ladies and gentlemen, there's a bigger relationship than the one with our wives. And it's very easy to deny that one through fear. Do you know when Peter tells us that we're always to be ready to give an answer to those that ask us a reason for the hope that is within us, he prefaces it by something that nobody ever reads. Don't be afraid. Because he realized that all of us get afraid. We all have a fear level that switches in. And we have to overcome fear. And oh, as we look back over life, who of us could hang our heads high and say we've never given in to peer pressure and denied the biggest relationship of all? Abraham was on a steep learning curve and left Egypt a humbler and a wiser man. What a silly thing it was to do, but it looked sensible to go down to Egypt for help. And the prophets warn against it, don't they? Because they saw behind Egypt a whole worldview that excluded God. And it's so easy for any of us to go down to Egypt for help when our resources seem to fail. Learning what a wife is is important, ladies and gentlemen. Because you notice this city-wife metaphor interchanges in the Bible. Babylon, that we studied, that Abram left in the sense that he left that background. In the New Testament, she becomes a woman, the mother of harlots, who's spectacularly beautiful. Have you noticed that? And that pinpoints what this is all about. Because the husband-wife relationship depends crucially on mutual loyalty and commitment. Which city do I live for? Babylon, the great prostitute, was scintillatingly beautiful. She wasn't, as some people picture it, some ugly woman that nobody would have been interested in. She was the exact opposite. Kings of the earth seduced by her. But the difference between a prostitute and a wife is a matter of loyalty. A prostitute is not loyal to any one husband. A wife is. So this journey, it's a journey looking for the city with foundations. And one of them is learning at different levels of depth what relationship really is. And taking that closest of human relationships and magnifying it up until we see that it's leading on to the greatest relationship of all, that between Christ Christ and his bride, the church. But we must proceed further. Abram comes out of Egypt, a very rich man, and Lot apparently has made a bit on the side as well so that the land can't support them. And now the pressure of ill-gotten gain creates a family problem. And the herdsmen are fighting. There's no space. The land is too small to contain them. And so Abram comes to Lot and says, let there be no strife between you and me. And between your herdsmen, my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Ah, he's beginning to learn the lesson. Do you see that? Abram's resolution of the difficulty is by an assertion of relationship. Let's not fight about the material stuff. We are brothers and that's a, most, a much more important relationship, is it? Watch Christians fight about legacies. You ever heard of a believer that's fought about a legacy? I've hardly ever met a family where it hasn't been a problem. It's always somebody that thinks that they're owed more, isn't there? We are brothers. How much does that settle? Well, we have to answer from our own experience. But wealth can lead to tension in families and disintegration. And so Abram, very magnanimously, apparently, says to Lot, you choose, the land is all yours. 
There's no record, of course, of Lot and Abram praying about it. There's no spiritual uh, dimension to it. So Lot looks up and he sees the cities of the plain and it looks absolutely beautiful like the Garden of Eden. And there's a city on the horizon called Sodom. And he moves his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. I said earlier incorrectly that the story is a story of two cities. It's a story of three, ladies and gentlemen. And the other one is Sodom. And we all know what Sodom stands for. It looked beautiful. But going for the advantage, the business advantage, meant that Abram, uh, that Lot had to move into the society of people who were renowned for their sheer wickedness and immorality. You want to be careful before you set up your business in Soho or in the red light district of any country. What a situation. Lot was guided by his eyes. Good business decision. He never thought of the influence of his move on his children and his life and his morality. And he was stepping step by step into disaster. May I say it this way? It's very dangerous to move near Sodom. How far is Sodom from any of us? One click. One click. That's all. As your hand hovers over the mouse, one click. We need to fight, don't we? Sinners that we are, to avoid the click that leads to Sodom and leads to disaster. So now Abram was alone. Lot had gone, and the Lord speaks, lift up your eyes and look from the place you are. And now God guides his eyes and repeats the promise. The next thing we read about is war. War of four kings against five, and it seemed to be an international thing. When you read it here, it seems so tiny. But some of these kings came from beyond Babylonia. They were a thousand kilometers or more away from where Abram was. This was a big deal, this war in which he got involved. And what happened was that the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and so on were defeated. And Lot was taken with all his possessions. So now he'd lost it all. And Abram heard, and he was very powerful at this time, and he had a standing army. And he went and he brought back, and it's so interesting to read what he brought back. Abram brought back all the possessions, and also brought back his kinsmen. Lot with his possessions, and the women, and the people. That's an interesting order, isn't it? But it shows what it's about. Now we read a most interesting thing. You've got to imagine what's happening. That the king of Sodom is coming out to meet Abram. And Abram's coming to meet the king of Sodom when suddenly from nowhere another figure appears. The king and priest Melchizedek appears from absolutely nowhere. He brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be uh, God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons. You take the goods. Now do you see what's happening here? Here's decision time. What is more important? People are things. What have you learnt, Abram? And the king of Sodom is coming out with an apparently wonderful job opportunity or gift opportunity. Give me the persons. They're the bothersome lot. You keep all the wealth. But hey, half a minute, Lot was one of the persons, wasn't he? 
And do you see what Abram said? I have lifted up my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. I wouldn't take a thread or sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. You've got to be extremely careful who you accept wealth and power from. Because there will always be a payback day. What's it all about? Because this apparently minimalist incident becomes a major topic in the book of Hebrews. Melchizedek, let me just read what is said in the New Testament about him. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abram apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he's also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He's without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning or days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. What is this? Who was he? Importance is obvious. The most quoted bit of the Old Testament in the New is the psalm that says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Psalm 110, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this is no innocent thing. But surely, what do you mean he'd no father or mother? In the text of Genesis, of course, you notice that every principal person in Genesis has a genealogy. That is crucial for Abram, for Isaac, for Jacob. But this man, no. It's not that he didn't literally have a father or mother. It's as he appears in this text. He's introduced with very careful literary style to convey a message that you'd never have guessed if you only have this text. And he came in crucially to equip Abram to make one of the biggest decisions of his life. What's it all about? Well, I could take you to the room in Cambridge where as a student I first learned this, what it meant to have a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. I can see it. Reading some cyclist-styled notes that David Gooding had written or had written at the age of 21, expounding this book of Hebrews. And it opened up a whole new world to me. Because I'd often asked myself the question, in the crises of life, what is it keeps you holding on to God in faith? We talk about the eternal security of the believer. That's wonderful. But what happens if a person stops believing? We believe that God has provided for our guilt on the cross. He's provided for our character in sending His Holy Spirit and regenerating us. But what about the maintenance of our faith? And the major message of the book of Hebrews is this, isn't it? We have such a high priest. And what does he do? He ever lives to make intercession for us. And the book of Hebrews is full of encouragement to press on. Don't throw away your confession. Why not? What can encourage me to go on is this, that this king priest is prepared to intervene in my life right now and buttress my faith to take the next step. You see, I often wondered, why have we a high priest? Isn't the cross enough? Isn't the resurrection enough? Isn't the sending of the Holy Spirit enough? Well, if we didn't need a high priest, God wouldn't have given us one, would he? That's the easy answer. Do you remember Peter? Mixed up Peter. Oh Lord, I'm ready to go to prison if I have to, and to death. And then he discovered he didn't have to. And he denied the Lord, his relationship. 
But before he did it, the Lord had said to him quietly, I have prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail. Didn't pray for his testimony or his witness or his control of language. They all failed. But Jesus set himself to pray for the thing that links Peter to the Lord. His faith, I prayed for you that your faith does not fail. And when you've turned again, not if you turn again, when you've turned again, establish your brothers. In the journey of life, we're going to face big questions. Big decisions. And Abraham is only beginning to learn the, le the lessons of faith. His justification by faith is the next thing in the text. But the wonderful thing is that this king, he's king of a city, Salem, which means peace, Jerusalem. And he's called Melchizedek, Sadiq, righteous. And that preaches a big message too. You can't have peace without righteousness, you know. And he appears, comes out of nowhere and disappears. And he brings bread and wine to sustain us. Oh, you'd be dim if you didn't begin to think beyond that, wouldn't you? Because the Melchizedek sat with a bunch of men in Jerusalem Fearful. And he brought out bread and wine, didn't he? And there was a man sitting there whose eyes were full of material wealth and the silver shekels. And the tragedy of the situation was they asked who it was, they didn't know who it was. He that dips his bread. He to whom I'll offer the bread. And as you know, in the Middle East, offering that bread was an offer of friendship. And if a man was in a room and offered you the bread and you were the worst enemy, desperate to be reconciled, you could take that bread and the relationship would be healed. And the bread moves around. And Judas takes it in utter hypocrisy. He had every space in his heart for the gifts, but none for the giver. He brought out bread and wine. And the tragedy and irony of that situation is that they were symbols of the great work of the cross, which was to provide forgiveness for everybody who repented and trusted the Lord. It's a big story, isn't it? And in those dim and distant beginnings in the ancient world, Abram was beginning to learn. He was learning that wife is important, that relationships are important, that kinship is important, that people matter more than things. But the trouble was, he'd been promised a vast nation by God. And he had no children. No son. And after these things, the word of the Lord came. And that expression is only used twice with Abram. The word of the Lord came. So now we know it's going to be something of utter importance. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be their heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven. Number the stars. If you are able to number them, so shall your offspring be. And there the man stood and could see a little way into the hundred billion stars of our galaxy. And he believed God. God, oh, that's colossal, isn't it? 
stand with him. No evidence, no child, no nothing. He believed God. And one of the most important statements of the whole of Scripture now follows. And he, that is God, accounted it to Abram as righteousness. This is the base principle of how people are put right with God. That they exercise that glorious gift that every creature has as a creature made in the image of God. The capacity to trust. And the whole weary way of sin up to this point in Genesis is that battle. Are we going to trust God or not? And he believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. The New Testament gives us insight. Romans 4.23, for the words it was counted to him for righteousness were not written for his sake only, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. To justify, of course, means to declare righteous, not to make righteous. The Old Testament instructions to judges, if there be a controversy between men and they come to judgment and the judges judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. The righteous were righteous to start with. The judges had to declare them righteous. And this is of momentous importance, isn't it? The relationship of Abram's faith to yours and mine. Now, we are not expected to father children at the age of 100. But Abram was confronted with deadness in Sarai's body. Could he believe that God could create new life? It wasn't his faith that created the life. God did that in response to his faith. And we end where we began, ladies and gentlemen. This is the truth that sent Paul to the ends of the earth with the gospel. I'm not ashamed, are you, of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first, and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. But now the righteousness of God is manifested apart from the law. And the prophets, though the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. It's glorious, isn't it? Because it needs to be emphasized that trusting God is not contributing to salvation. Faith is the opposite of works to the one that does not work, says Paul, but trusts. His faith is counted as righteousness. That gives us a message that's worth preaching to a world whose eyes are religiously closed to the magnificent possibility that it is possible to be declared right with God by trusting God and not relying on your own idolatrous brain. Now we're coming to this final talk. And I'm so grateful to you for your attention, for your encouragements, and above all, for your prayers. And it's appropriate to mention some of the things that have helped me in my preparation. I have, of course, read many books. And it's invidious, in a way, to mention them, but the ones that have particularly helped me From the Jewish side, old Robert Alter's book on Genesis, the brilliant Meyer Sternberg's book on the poetics of biblical narrative, which everyone should read, and Leon Cass's book, 
the beginning of wisdom, reading Genesis from a philosophical perspective. On the Christian side, the old commentary by Marcus Dodds on Genesis, Gordon Wenham's magisterial two-volume work, The Word Biblical Commentary on Genesis, and Derek Kidner's little IVP commentary on Genesis. But one book that's been particularly helpful has been given to each of you in a little bag with Myrtlefield House written on the front of it. It is David Gooding's most recent book, The Riches of Divine Wisdom. Now, David Gooding has been my mentor for more years than I care to remember. And I owe him my initial insights into the riches of Scripture. He it is to whom I owe an unrepayable debt for helping me to understand how to mine at least some of those riches. And now, at the age of 88, he has given us a book that I think you will find incredibly helpful because it deals with the difficult passages in the New Testament as it expounds the Old and covers them in considerable detail, in particularly, but not only, those passages on Abraham. So please read the book that you've been given, but there's another book in that pack. It's called True to the Faith. It is not a commentary, but an exposition of the book of Acts, and I call it an apologetic exposition. Because what I've tried to do here in a limited way, I feel that we need to learn how to expound Scripture into the culture, rather than collecting a few questions from the culture and going back to Scripture and collecting a few verses relating to those questions, to study Scripture as books and use them as a powerful searchlight to analyze the culture. That's a very different way round. And in that book, True to the Faith on the Book of Acts, it is seminal in my mind for helping us to understand the way in which Scripture is structured in terms of its thought flow, its logic, and its powerful way of dealing with the fundamental questions that face us in the Europe of the 21st century coming all the way from the first. So, I would encourage you to read that book. But why did we do Abraham? I wouldn't have chosen it myself. And I feel greatly indebted to someone who's in this audience, Alec McElhinney of the Lang Trust, who a year ago said to me, why don't you do Abraham? And you know, it's one of those things in life that's a little bit unusual, because I don't normally have my topic suggested to me in that way. Secondly, I knew that Abram is a very difficult and big topic, but it so impacted me when he mentioned it that I couldn't get rid of it. And I'm going to be honest with you. There were several times in the past year where I wanted to write to the committee to change the messages because I was finding it simply too difficult to cope with the sheer size of Abraham. But that voice kept coming back. Abraham is important. You should do Abraham. So I feel it right to acknowledge the friend that suggested it to me. So I stand as a debtor to so many people. And I say that to encourage you. I couldn't have begun to think of doing these things had someone not taken me under their wing years ago. And of course, I'm indebted to my wife, but I told you about her the first day, didn't I? <laughs> so important to get another perspective. And you know, it's worth hearing even from your wife, you can't say that. <laughs> to get another perspective, and particularly a woman's perspective, because our audience is mixed, isn't it? So with those preliminaries, we're going to go back to the final section of this magnificent story that runs from chapters 20 to 25 of the book of Genesis. And we'll see in chapter 20 that Abram, having had the 
experience of dealing with Ishmael in his home and then the awful devastation of Sodom and Gomorrah now faces the supreme test of his life. And incidentally, the scripture is full of twists. We look at Sodom and we revolt against it, and yet, 20 centuries later, Jesus stood in a village in Galilee, and he said, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah that were done in you, they would have repented. Therefore, it will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for them than for you. I leave you to work out what that means. Abram stood and watched the demise of Sodom. The man who believed God. Lot ended crawling into a cave with his two daughters. And yet, those daughters had children. One of the children was a man called Moab. Moab. Lot's wife looked back, and centuries later, there was a lovely woman, and she said to the Moabite girl, Go back! And Ruth said, No. I'm not going back. And she became an ancestress of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Out of that cave, ladies and gentlemen. So there stood Abram in his faith, in his confidence in God. And there was Moab, born in the most unseemly situations. Both of them ancestors of the Savior. How do we cope with that kind of a God? Magnificent, isn't it? And I'm thankful for David over there who told me about this yesterday. It's lovely when people in conferences come up to you and tell you things you haven't seen before. That enriches life. So now leaving that, those deep lessons about the flesh, we come again to Abram who's learned all his lessons and never makes any mistakes again. No, we plunge straight back into another denial of his wife and calling her his sister. Before Abimelech, king of Gerar, and he sent and took Sarah, and God immediately intervened. Of course he did. Because what Abram now was doing was imperiling the identity of the seed. And if Abimelech had slept with Sarah, you'd never have known who the father of the seed was, would you? And God intervened. And Abram makes a feeble attempt when um, <coughs> Abimelech accuses him. And he calls Abram and said, What have you done? And how have I sinned against you that you've brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You've done to me things that ought not to be done. What did you see that you did this thing? I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place, and so on. And Abram makes three mistakes in his evaluation of this pagan. He mistakes facts. He mistakes values, and he mistakes the man's motivation. Those are all judgments, ladies and gentlemen. We've just come from a section where judgment is the key thing. But now it moves into another level of judgment. And we're all engaged in judging other people all the time. I'm afraid even at this conference, aren't we? If I were to take out of your or my conversation all the evaluations of other people you've made in the last four days, how much would be left? Are all those judgments accurate? Factually? Are they accurate in terms of understanding motives? Are they exact in terms of values? Of course they're not. And we're learning to follow God's way and his city. And Abram was delivered a hard blow. And some scholars say, how could this have happened the second time? This must be simply a retelling of the first incident. But they don't read the text. 
because Abram makes the point that he'd made this a settled policy. He did it again. Do you know, I find that so encouraging. Have you done it again? The most debilitating thing as we seek to walk after the Spirit is when we do it again, isn't it? And this should give us courage. Just think of the experience this man has had of God. And yet he does it again. And God doesn't write him off. But lifts him up and protects him. Because he has a purpose for him. And so for you, don't allow doing it again to destroy you. And to hold you down permanently. We repent and come back to him. We can get up even if it happens twice or more. And so after all this, the Lord visited Sarah, and she conceived and bore him a son in his old age. He was a hundred, and she was ninety. It's fascinating, isn't it? When you think of Sarah being beautiful enough at ninety to have to be protected from a pagan king. That is actually quite interesting scientifically, because the age of maturation seems to have decreased over the centuries. But you need to ask the experts of that. We've had a seminar on it here, actually. This longevity that slowly reduces so that at that time, you could still be beautiful at 90. Well, I wasn't beautiful at 20, so it's been <laughs> a fairly serious descent. But anyway, Abram gave to his son the name Yitzhak, which means he laughs. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. Who would have said to Abram that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. So, there was another person laughing. And that was Ishmael. He laughed and not perhaps the laugh of joy, but the laugh of mockery. And Sarah said, cast out the slave woman. And Abram was very upset at this. Because of his son, Ishmael, he'd come to love him. And God said to Abram, don't be displeased. Do what she says, because Isaac has got to be the one in which your offspring is named. But I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. God was interested in Ishmael and in his persistence and future existence and role on this planet. So Abram gets up early in the morning and gives her some bread and a skin of water. What is this? This is one of the wealthiest men in the region. This is his son. And he gives her a bottle of water and a bit of bread when he could have given her a whole train of donkeys and camels and food and an inheritance. And he doesn't do it. Why not? Perhaps because he secretly hoped she'd come back that evening. He didn't give her enough to last a day let alone a lifetime. I don't know because we're not told. But we do know that very rapidly the water ran out and she put the child under one of the bushes and went out of earshot so she couldn't hear the child screaming. And the voice came again, what troubles you, Hagar? For God has heard the voice of the boy. Up, lift him up and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. God does not forget Ishmael in all his love for Isaac. And we should remember it with the descendants of Ishmael in our contemporary world. And then we go back to the story of Abram. And it's Abimelech again. And there is difficulty about a well of water that Abimelech's servants 
have seized from Abram. And this begins to introduce us increasingly to the last major topic of this part of the book. Security. If you're going to survive, you need water, especially in a desert country. And losing a well was a very serious business. So Abram reproved Abimelech, and they came together, and they had a discussion, and they made a covenant. Not a covenant about salvation, but a covenant about the use of the well. It's very important, by the way. This word covenant gets bandied about a great deal. Not all covenants in Scripture are even about the same thing. The first covenant with Abram was about the land. And it's important to distinguish things that differ. This one was about having a well. And Abram planted a tamarisk in Beersheba, the seven wells, and called there on the name of the Lord the everlasting God. And with that, we come to chapter 22. And we're told that after those things, God tested Abraham. It's a test. The offering up of Isaac is one of the most profound, difficult stories in the whole of Scripture. It was hard to let Ishmael go, the son he loved and whom he'd hoped would one time be the heir. Now he was to be faced with letting go his second son. We've just had a tale of Hagar, a distraught mother and her son, driven into the desert and despairing of life, being saved by the intervention of an angel who showed them a well. We're about to meet something much deeper, but very similar. Abram, the anguished father, silently obeying an injunction from God to take his son into the wilderness and sacrifice him. And he's saved by the intervention of an angel. It's a test. But Abram, of course, couldn't know it was a test. It's a bit like quantum mechanics. If you observe the system, you change it. The one thing he couldn't know at the beginning is that he was being tested. And God said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, take your son and your only son, whom you love, and please go to the land of Moriah. Please go. Years before, God had appeared to him in his magnificent glory and said, Go! And now, that same God says, Abram, please. It was a request, not a command. Very unusual. And God describes Isaac as Abram's son his only son, the son you love. Three things about him that bound the lad to his father with the deepest possible bounds. Take him and burn him, please. The word for a burnt offering in Greek is holocaust, ladies and gentlemen. How are we to react to this? It was a devastating moment. And we all know, of course, it's been a focus of a great deal of criticism. How can we respect a God who approves of sacrificing a child? But is that really what's involved? After all, in the event, whatever you may say about it, Abram did not have to sacrifice Isaac. And the Old Testament is the book par excellence that describes God as utterly abhorred with 
child sacrifice, offering to Molech, and so on. But you can't begin to tackle those questions before you understand a little bit of what's going on. It's the greatest test of his life, an entirely new dimension. God had said, go. God had said, believe me. God had said, I'm God Almighty, walk before me and be perfect. And I'm going to give you a son. And he waited year after year after year after year. And supernaturally a child was conceived. Please notice that. The thing was supernatural. And the whole context is geared to convince us that it was supernatural. And Abram sought to protect that son. He secured the well. He secured a future. Hagar and Ishmael have been dealt with by sending them away. And Abram's done everything because, of course, his whole future is tied up with Isaac and the seed project. The project of bringing the line of Messiah into the world won't even get started if Isaac doesn't get married and have a son. And he's only a lad, perhaps about 13 at this stage. Take him and burn him. What's it all about? It reminds me a little of Daniel's three friends who were told that unless they bowed down to Nebuchadnezzar's image, they wouldn't live. And so everything was on the line, their home, their job, their reputation, their family, or their lives. This is harder. Because you see, it wasn't Abram's life that was on the line. It was Isaac's. That made it so much more difficult. What could it mean? And we don't read of any verbal response that he made. We do not even know if Sarah knew anything about it until it was over. And there's no record of Abram protesting against what God was asking and pleading for the life of Isaac as he pled for the life of Lot. He simply did what he was told. The philosopher Kierkegaard thought that what Abram was asked to sacrifice was reason itself, since it was a complete contradiction between God's promise to bless the world through Isaac and his request to kill him. But now the New Testament shows us that that was not the case. He who received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, in Isaac shall your seed be called, he, Abram, considered that God was able to raise the dead. From which figure of lives he leaves speaking, he did receive him by. That's a supernatural insight, of course, into Abram's reasoning. And it is immensely important, isn't it? Some people superficially react to this story and say it is so dangerous because that means God could put it into my head to take a gun and shoot you. Oh, wait a minute. Have you noticed that people who take guns to shoot in classrooms, as that young man did the other day, they don't believe their victims are going to rise from the dead? We mustn't confuse things that are profoundly different in their essence. The New Testament assures me that Abram had got to the point in his thinking that if God asks me to do this, I don't understand why, because it seems to ruin all the promises. Therefore, the only logical possibility is if I have to Kill him, he'll rise from the dead. I'm amazed at that, you know. Abram didn't know a hundredth of what we know in this room. Not a hundredth. A 
Have we got there to that stage? Abram had the experience of this, of course. His body good as dead, Sarah's good as dead. Can God bring life from the death was the big issue circling the birth of Isaac. It now gets even bigger, the very same issue. Can God generate physical life? So Abram is thinking that Isaac must live, not Isaac must die. He sees the ultimate goal. Although as a father, he must have been torn to pieces psychologically inside. He took with him two lads as well as Isaac, and the order is so odd He saddles the donkey before he splits the wood. A hundred-year-old man. In the whole confusion of the thing. You saddle the donkey last, of course, normally. But you imagine what's preying on his mind as he picks up an axe and cuts the wood and knows it's going to be used to burn his son. That would confuse anybody to get the order wrong. It was a three-day journey to Mount Moriah. Days passed over in silence. With what turmoil and perplexity in Abram's mind, we don't know. And then, with his spine tingling, he recognizes the outline of the mountain that God had told him of. And he knows that the time has come. So he tells the two lads to wait while I and my son go to worship and we will return to you. Isaac was old enough to be involved in worship. He wasn't a child. We will return. Is that a prophecy? Is it a despairing hope? Or is it an expression of a trembling faith that God's going to raise the boy from the dead? And Abram puts the wood for the fire on Isaac's shoulders. And he carries the fire and the knife. Thus father and son slowly ascend the mountain. They went, both of them together. Yachtav. They went, both of them together. There's something so deliberate about this. A dad and his son. The dad and his son. In whom all the hopes of the planet, in a sense, are resting. And they're starting to climb the final ascent in more ways than one. The Genesis Rabbah, which is a Jewish Midrash commentary, says that Isaac with the wood on his back is like a condemned man carrying his own cross. And the centuries flit by in our imagination. He went out bearing his own cross. But that was a son that had the choice. Isaac had not. But Isaac breaks the tension of silence and he spoke to his father, Avi, my father, dad. The first conversation in scripture between a father and a son. Here am I, my son. Dad, the fire, the wood. Where's the lamb, dad? Isaac doesn't mention the knife. Because perhaps there's now just the beginnings of the flutter of apprehension in his heart. How can Abram now avoid telling him the horrific truth? Son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. A lamb will be provided. Is this a prayer, a prophecy, or an expression of uncommon trust? Abram may be speaking more than he knows, and perhaps there's rising in his heart the hope that Isaac won't need to be 
killed because his words turn out in the end to be exactly right. So they went, both of them, together. What did it sound like to Isaac? His silence is impressive. And conveys more than a hint that Isaac accepts his father's explanation. But also that Isaac may be slowly realizing that he is the intended sacrifice. Nothing is said. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers was dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He didn't know much. He wasn't able to say, my God, my God, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But in silence, he goes up the mountain. And Isaac sees the knife in the hand of his father. Why didn't he simply stab him in the back so the boy never saw the blade that was coming? Oh no. He binds him. In Jewish thinking, this is the binding, Akita, of Isaac. Now, Isaac was a tough young man who could easily have outrun a hundred year old father. The binding suggests to me that it was done willingly and cooperatively. What did Abram feel? What did Isaac feel? It's a turmoil of emotions that I'm, at least me, far behind. I can't begin to, to penetrate this. Taking the lad whom he loved, and in whom all his hope was, and with trembling hands, getting him to lie down on the wood. And then Abram takes out his knife and took it to slay his son. He lifts it up. The whole of heaven watches. This is the highest point of drama that the Bible has got to so far in its storyline. And Abram's prepared to bring it down and he's tensing his muscles when suddenly, Abram, Abram! And his knife hand is frozen in space and time as the voice speaks once again. To him, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abram lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns, and he went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abram called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. I do not know what it means that it was a ram, the father of a lamb that was caught in the thicket. But it seems to me to underline the sheer complexity of what's going on here. It's not simply a son suffering, it's a father suffering. Because we watch that. What a magnificent triumph. I'm reminded of what we sang on the Mount of Crucifixion. Fountains open, deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love 
Like mighty rivers poured incessant from above, and heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. Oh, this is very big stuff, isn't it? I almost tremble to talk to you about it. I feel I'm on the holiest ground because time seems to collapse as we think of the other father and the other son who went up in all probability the very same mountain together and where the knife was allowed to fall. It's our salvation. This is the gospel. This is our God. Oh, Abram, as he watched that night as the covenant was made in chapter 15, the horror of a great darkness as God with his lamp went through the pieces. It was a symbol, but this is the reality. And we all watch. As Christ didn't go through the pieces, he became the pieces. This is the reality of which all of this speaks. Now I know, says God. What do you mean he knows? Isn't God omniscient? Now this is very important, ladies and gentlemen. Because the New Testament tells us that what happened here was that Abram was justified by his works. And that doesn't contradict his justification by faith. It is that God expects the reality of our faith to be demonstrated in what we do. You see, there's a common notion that we are justified before God by faith and before men by our works, but that isn't true. This is the paradigm incident. There were no other men there. It wasn't that men would know. It's now I know, says God. When I was a child, I'd heard about Siberia. It was very cold. I believed it. Then I went to Siberia and discovered it was very cold. <laughs> but there's a difference in knowing it by reading books about it and experiencing it. Now, you can argue from now to eternity philosophically about the nature of God's omniscience, but when I read here that God says, now I know, I believe it's true, that God expects the evidence that Abram's faith is real. And God expects the evidence that my faith and your faith is real. We talk about mountaintop experiences, ladies and gentlemen. We should be careful. This was the mountaintop experience. Have you been up a mountain with God recently? God wants to know that you're real. He wants to know that I'm real. There's so much hypocrisy in my heart. So much deceit, so much pretense, so much playing the religious game. And in the end, God, in his wisdom, will test us. This was a unique test, of course, because it has so huge ramifications. I'm not Abram, and nor are you. But at our lesser level, God requires the evidence, doesn't he? And in that sense, he was justified by his works. That is, his activity, what he did, confirmed the reality of his justification by faith. It didn't cause it, it confirmed it. And God demanded the evidence. And then God swears. And that is quoted too in the letter to the Hebrews. God swears to Abraham. And the application is very simple. And it's said in Hebrews 
Thus Abram, having patiently waited, obtained the promise, for people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desi desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It was a dramatic moment, and the whole world changed. He'd moved from being a pagan naturalist. He'd seen the glory of God. God had, in his grace, limited himself in giving him pictures that assured him in terms of covenants. But now, after it all, he'd passed the test. And he proved that his faith was real. It's such a contrast between denying his wife and offering Isaac, isn't it? What a shift in such a small space of time. And the man stands forever as a paradigm of what it means to trust God, but also as a prototype on that mountain of the gospel. I want to read a Jewish commentary on this. My father took his knife to me. How could he? Why did he? What did the Lord want of him and me? Yet Isaac knows that his father stopped short, that something summoned him to stop, that his father offered up a ram in his stead, and that his life was restored to him, even as it was being given up. Even if he did not hear the divine voice, he has reason to suspect that he owes his life less to his father, more to gracious powers invisible. That his life, like any other human life, is an unmerited gift from beyond. The heart of the story is the conversation between father and son as they went together up the mountain that began with Isaac's question, where is the lamb? And ended with Abram's speech that proved prophetic. Even if Isaac did not hear the divine voice, but soon after saved his life, and even if he subsequently feels estranged from his father and from the God to whom he was offered, he will never forget his father's interpretation of the event. Somewhere in his soul, he will always remember that singular conversation of transmission in which Abram counseled him regarding the deep perplexities of life. Somewhere in his soul, he will always remember that Abram taught him to place his trust not in his father but in God. What about us, fathers and mothers? Have we got it across to our children that God can take them on their journey of faith despite our failures? Father and Son, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not with him freely give us all things? But the son is still young. He's yet to be married. And the grand finale is this magnificent story of a bride for the promised seed. And Abram calls his servant And the manner of his promising shows the immense trust that he places in his servant. Don't take for my son a wife 
for the local Canaanites. Go back to my relatives in Mesopotamia to find a suitable girl. Oh, says the servant, what if the woman won't follow me and come here? Must I bring your son back to the land from which you came? No, says Abram. The Lord will send his messenger and guide you, but if she doesn't follow you, you're clear of your oath. Whatever happens, don't bring Isaac there. What's that all about? Abram longs for a bride for his son who will repeat his journey. That's what it's all about. It started with the journey. And now the cycle has come. The promised seed has been born. And now for the projected seed project to go forward, he must have a wife that will repeat his journey. I hope you've got such a wife or a husband. Oh, young men, if I may speak to you frankly, whatever you do, find a wife if God has called you to have a wife that will go on the journey. That will go on the journey. And so the servant took his camels. Oh, this is a story, isn't it? And here people say, Lennox, you've been talking mythology for four days. Absurd. This whole story of Abraham is simply fiction because we all know that there were no camels available at that time. Well, you know, we happen to have in our midst a world expert on these camels. I'm sorry that all of you didn't hear his seminar, which I attended yesterday. He's Dr. Martin Heide, and he's done us all in the scholarly world a great service by doing intensive research on these camels and discovered that they are authentic historically. Google his name, Dr. Martin Heide, H-E-I-D-E, -E, on the internet, and you can read all about the camels. camels. We are not in the area of myth. We are in the area of authentic history. Now, it was quite a journey, 21 days by camel, or a bit more, for the 800 kilometers to the north, up from the Canaan to Haran. And it's a wonderful story. I wish I had time to go through it with you, but I don't. Where the man, the servant, prayed that God would guide him. And he prayed that a girl would come and give him to drink, but not only him to drink, his camels. So just imagine the situation. This beautiful girl comes. And she gives him to drink. And they, the text is a brilliant bit of storytelling in the Hebrew form. It keeps the suspense going. She gives him a little to drink, but is she going to give water to the camels? And then she says, I'll feed all the camels and fill them with water until they've ended. 25 gallons each. That's quite something, isn't it? And there's a tremendous description, very vivid, of her doing this. A whirl of activity. A subject of 11 verbs of action and one of speech in three verses in the text. It's about hospitality, ladies and gentlemen. The test for the girl was her hospitality. It's a big topic, you see, in this text. We're not forgetting the subjects we've learned. He knows in his heart before God that one of the major things is going to be her attitude to the stranger. Mind you, it was helped when he suddenly produced a beautiful gold set of earrings that weighed about a ton. You imagine this young girl seeing this and asked, I want to tell my mom about this, you know. And so off she went to her mom, and there was Laban. And Laban, in a comical way, the text says, he noticed the gold, and he said, Oh, come in, blessed are thou of the Lord, of course. There are people that react like that, aren't there? They discriminate between people according to the level of their gold. And there's all sorts of argument. And the man says, I've got to go now. And it's put to Rivka, to Rebecca. Will you go with this man? She's never seen her husband to be. But she's seen as well. And now comes the big decision. 
I will go. And she makes the journey. 21 days of wandering. And she comes into the fields at evening. And she sees a man walking in the cool of the garden in the evening. Who's that? That's your husband. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we'd be dim if we couldn't see what this is about. This is what we're about. This is our task, like Eliezer the servant, to take the wealth of the master's son and show it to people and say, will you go? And encourage them to fall in love with someone they've never seen to make that journey. Do you know, as I close, let me tell you this. Where did Christ begin his ministry? At a wedding. No one must outshine a bride at her wedding. That's pretty basic politeness, isn't it? But at that wedding at Cain of Galilee, John tells us he revealed his glory. Why was Jesus at a wedding? Because he was looking for a bride. He showed his glory. And Peter says, I was called by that glory. It got me. Has it got you? Is that what motivated you? You've seen some of the wealth. And you started a journey. Oh, may God help us. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it started in Babel City. A prostitute. An unfaithful girl of beauty. Where is it going to end this story that begins in Babel? It's going to end and begin with a marriage, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Christ is so big. Uh, it's going to take all the millions of believers throughout all the ages to constitute his bride. And eternity will begin when we arrive at that wedding day. And I often think, you know, when I get there, my wife, Will I turn to her and say, Sally, if I'd known what it was like, I'd have invested far more in it. May God bless you.